Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bass and today we are talking swim baits. Everything to do with swim baits from wake baits to glide baits, multi joints, soft baits, bluegill baits, swim bait rods, everything you need to know about swim bait fishing. Let's go. Swim bait fishing is an enormous category, probably the biggest category in all of bass fishing because it encompasses everything from big top waters, big hard baits, uh, to subsurface soft baits, to baits meant to be fished in 20, 30, 40, 50 feet of water, baits that can be crawled on bottom, baits that can be burned in the middle of the water column, and everything in between. The category is huge. So my goal here today is to really simplify it for you, to drum it down. Now, in order to do that, we are going to take bites out of an enormous category together. First thing we're going to do is really dumb it down. For the guy who's just getting started, you're interested in swim baits, you don't know if this is for you, we're starting with you. I've got four baits for you. After that, we're going category by category. We're going to do, uh, We'll start with soft baits. We'll do paddle tails, then wedge tails, then soft bluegill baits. Then we'll do hard bluegill baits, hard multi-joint baits, open water glide baits, cover glide baits, wake baits, and then baits specifically for the northern or the smallmouth guy. Uh, before we jump into this, before we jump into these four baits for the beginners, I just want to take a second. Uh, YouTube is an amazing place. There's so much information out there. It's incredible. When I got started, none of the information I'm about to lay out for you existed. I try to do a video like this about once a year. And it's to give back to the community because again, this didn't exist when I got started. So I bought literally thousands and thousands and thousands of swim baits. Uh, you probably can't come up with a bait name that was ever mainstream that I don't own a stack of because that's what you had to do to learn. There was no shortcut. Now, YouTube is amazing because it allows you to really cut down the time needed, but there's also a downside. Anybody can speak on YouTube, so you don't know if the information you're getting is quality information. So I don't wanna brag on myself whatsoever. I just wanna give you a very, very brief background so that you understand why I'm doing this and that you can trust the information. So I've been throwing swim baits for more than 20 years, uh, specifically targeted double digit largemouth for almost all of those years. Uh, absolutely loved it. Uh, I have caught bass over 10 pounds on a swim bait in 12 different lakes. Uh, I've thrown swim baits in 22 states and four countries. Uh, I love throwing big baits. Uh, I have been blessed to catch a lot of fish over 10 pounds on a swim bait. Uh, but one day I hit my magic number. I caught one and it just didn't feel the same. It was, a, it was a fish over 10 pounds and it didn't feel like all the others had felt. And I realized that the day had arrived where me catching them didn't matter to me as much as it used to. I wanted other people to catch them. Uh, that turned into my guide service and of course tactical where we teach and help other people. Uh, and the whole thing has grown from there. So today I am giving you 20 plus years worth of knowledge all rolled up. Now, obviously that's a lot of information and it's a lot of swim baits over a lot of categories. That can be overwhelming. That's why we're starting small and we're gonna take it by category. I don't expect you to ever do this. Now there are a lot of addicted people who buy a lot of baits, but you don't need to do this. We're gonna go by category. That way, if it's wedge tails and you're interested in throwing a wedge tail swim bait, you can listen to the handful of baits and what each one is for, what I use it for, and you can find the one or the two that fit your style, and that's all you need. You don't have to buy all this to find out that this is the one for you, or buy all of this and find out that all you needed was this little guy for the lake that you're on, right? We're trying to drum this down in pieces. 
So again, I just wanted to give you a little background about where this is coming from and why about once a year, because this is a, it's a giant video. So it's only about once a year I'm willing to sit down and really pour it out for you. And it changes year to year because my fishing style changes. Uh, I go to new fisheries. I catch fish on different baits. I constantly over the years latch onto a bait for a few years and just blast fish on it. And then I don't know if it's that I get bored of doing the same thing or it's that I start exploring other lakes, but I'll end up latching onto something else for a few years. And it's been that way over the years, time and time and time again. Uh, so my interests and what I think is best do sort of shift with the seasons, uh, but it's really interesting. So let's start again for the beginners and we'll go from there. For the guy who just wants to dabble, I grabbed four baits here for you. And you don't even need all four of these. You can just pick and choose. But all four of these are baits that are capable of catching a big bass that will show you whether or not you like swim bait fishing without having to buy a swim bait rod. Once you get into serious swim bait fishing, the rod that you use is one of the most important decisions you can make because you don't want to invest all the money in the swim baits, the time to go out, learn how to throw them, go to the lake day after day, maybe travel to destinations and then lose the fish. And these fish are strong, not all of them, but the right ones, the ones that you did all of that for, they're powerful. So the right rod is everything. But to kick this thing off, you don't want to go all in and then find out, hey, this isn't really for you. So four baits that can catch a big one, a bluegill imitator. This is the Savage Gear line through bluegill. You can get away with throwing it on a jig rod, even though it's a fairly heavy bait, it's line through. So it's got a treble, the line goes through the nose and attaches to a size two treble. A size two treble is no bigger than what's on a typical crankbait. That's why you can throw it on a jig rod. So when you hook them, you'll hook them on the treble, the bait will slide up and you can fight that fish. But that is a full size bluegill imitator. And in much of the South, in farm ponds everywhere, in natural lakes all over the country, bluegill is king. And that's a really good swimming, solid option. Now you can mount that treble on the belly or the back. Typically I mount it on the belly and I fish the bait pretty quickly. Just straight retrieve. This isn't like a crankbait where there's a lot of stop and go, trying to trigger reactions. With a wedge tail style tail here, where it's got that sort of an action, just a slow methodical kick, you don't want to start and stop. It's just a steady retrieve and they either want it or they don't want it. You just keep chucking and whining, covering water. It's that easy. There's no system to it. There's no tricks. It's just covering water. So it's very simple for a beginner and a giant will eat it. The next one, this is an S waiver. This is a glide bait, single joint hard bait. You can throw this on a jig rod. You could throw this on a big crankbait rod. This is a bait that takes a little something extra, but it can be straight retrieved. Throw it out and just slow wind it back. And the bait, the name is S waiver. It will do an S through the water like this. The first time you see it, you'll think it's goofy. No, it's right. Now what I like to do is about every six handle turns or so, four to six handle turns, I give it two twitches, pop, pop. So I'm reeling and I never break the cadence of my reeling. I just add the twitches, pop, pop, just like that. What'll happen is that bait's swimming and then it'll kick, kick, and then it'll keep swimming. That's all there is to it. But this is the S waiver 168. It's a very small profile. It gets giant bites. I have netted quite a few double digits that have eaten that bait. The last two are smaller soft baits. This is about as universal as it gets. This is the six inch mega bass mag draft. You could throw this on almost any rod you own. Again, it's a size two treble. It's not that heavy. It's got a magnet, so the hook will just stick to the belly. Or you can take it and there's a slot in the belly and you can just slide it into that slot. and It'll sit like that as well. That's actually how I like to fish it. 
But same deal, this bait has a sweet speed. Throw it out, start a retrieve, go a little faster, a little slower until you find that perfect kick. Once you found that kick, that's your speed. Don't change. That's it. It'll fish pretty high in the water column. So you can fish it over the tops of laydowns, over the tops of grass, around docks. This is a bait that I skip under docks a lot. And we'll circle back to that when we get to this category next. Uh, but that is an amazing bait that will catch every species of bass all over the country. And then last but not least is this little Big Bite Baits B5. It's a small profile, it's a five inch bait. When I started out swim baiting, we wouldn't have called these swim baits. These were way too small. If it was under about an eight inch bait, it wasn't a swim bait. But the category has changed. And if a guy wants to build confidence, this is a swim bait. And you can build confidence with this bait. This is one of the baits that this year I slayed with. I started out slaying monster smallmouth with it. Uh, it's a line through. So line through the nose, line comes out the belly, and then you just tie it to your size four treble, and you just stab that treble in the belly, and there it sits. Just like a mag draft, just chuck and wind. What I like about this bait, especially for the beginner, and why I latched onto it when I was up north, you can throw it on super light line. 10 to 12 pound line. Now you can throw it on heavy line too, but 10 to 12 will fish it just fine because it's just a size four treble, it's nothing. I'm throwing this on a medium heavy rod with pretty light fluorocarbon and just covering water and it's amazing how well they eat it. I started out throwing it because I was up north and I was in crystal clear water, like 20 plus feet of visibility and I wanted to throw 12 pound fluoro, straight fluoro, because the water was so clear. That was the only swim bait I had that I could throw on gear that light, and it worked. I've since brought it back to the south and caught fish on it everywhere I went. So those four baits are amazing beginner baits that will help you, any one of them, will help you decide if this category is for you. All right, let's jump into the heart of this video. It's gonna be a monster, guys. There's no way around it. But swim bait fishing is incredible and it is worth the effort. So we're gonna start here with paddle tail swim baits. Uh, we'll start with the mag draft. The mag draft is high in the water column. Then we'll go to weedless baits. Then we'll go to what I would call open water or more universal baits. And then we'll wrap it up with sort of bottom crawling baits. Okay, here we go. Kicking it off, we just talked about the mag draft, the six inch. There's the eight inch, there's the 10 inch. This family of baits just slays fish. There's just no way around it. Uh, the six inch is an amazing universal do everything bait. I feel the exact same way about the eight inch. The eight inch is my all around bait. Uh, the reason why is that with swim baits, drawing power is critical. The larger the bait, and we haven't even got into where we throw these, why we throw these, all that stuff. We'll, we'll split that in here intermittently. Right now we're just talking through some baits because I wanted to get the beginner started. But the eight inch bait is like the perfect amount of drawing power. So the bigger the swim bait, the farther a bass will come to look at it. Bass are hardwired to follow big, slow moving fish. If you've ever seen an injured fish in clear water swimming along and five or 10 feet behind it, there's a bass swimming along. They're just hardwired to have a look. Now from there, they have to either want to bite or you have to be using a bait that can trigger them to bite, but they're hardwired to follow. The bigger the bait, the more likely they are to follow and the more distance they will cover to get to it. So say you've got 10 feet of visibility in a lake and you're throwing a six inch bait. They might come five, six, seven feet to get to that bait. What I mean is if you were throwing a worm and there was a bass sitting on a dock piling, you would have to land the worm next to the dock piling and work it for that fish to eat it. You could take a mag draft and swim it four or five feet from that dock piling and that fish would come out. 
an eight inch bait, she'll come out six, seven, eight feet. It's just a bigger bait, it's slow moving, it has more drawing power. A 10 inch bait or bigger, they will come a long, long, long ways. In crystal clear water, you can pull fish off the bottom in 20, 30, 40 plus feet of water to come up and inspect a slow moving giant swim bait. It's incredible. It's an amazing tool because you can show up to a lake you've never been to. As long as the water's clear enough that you can see into it, you could show up with a bait like this and just go around the bank throwing that big bait and just looking 10 feet behind it. Whether you ever get bit or not, the caliber of fish that are in that lake will immediately be known to you. If it's full of two pounders, you'll see two pounders. If it's full of five pounders, you'll see five pounders. If there's a 12 pounder sitting in that lake, she will pop up behind that bait and you will see her on day one. It's incredible. So that drawing power is such a tool. It helps you figure out the size of fish in the lake if this is a lake you even wanna be fishing. It helps you uh, establish which spots have the best fish. Because if you can get them to rise to a bait, whether they eat it or not, typically, now spotted bass are a different animal, but typically bass are very territorial. So if you raise a giant largemouth, you just found her home. She doesn't roam very far. You know, even if the lake has a lot of rise and fall where she has to leave, she'll leave for a season, but come back to the same place. It's amazing. You know where her home is. So over time, you can catch that fish that you identified on your very first day on the lake. So again, the eight inch seems to be the perfect balance of drawing power, and size that they just want to engulf. A two to three pounder has no problem inhaling this hole if they want it, no problem. Even smaller fish can get hooked. Uh, but a two to three pounder will pound on an eight inch bait, especially in a lake that has a, lar a lot of larger bait fish, whether that's trout, kokanee, gizzard shad, hitch, big threadfin shad, shiners, perch, whatever it is, if there's large bait fish that those fish are used to being around, they will munch on an eight inch bait. So this bait, I like to fish this. Let's talk about where, because paddle tails are a giant category in and of themselves. The mag draft is a pretty shallow water bait for me. So it's my bait for fishing visible cover. And it's a bait that I crushed with this year. I had a mag draft year. They ate it up. So for me, the mag draft is like the spinner bait of bass fishing, meaning I can just go down the shore with it. I could show up to a lake and if there's bass in less than 10 feet of water, I'm in business. Uh, I can fish around laydowns. I can fish over and around grass. I can fish the edges of steep banks. I can parallel bluff walls on shade lines anything docks were my bread and butter this spring. So the mag draft is an amazing dock skipping bait. So it comes with that magnet. So this can just sit here. Well, that particular one was a little weak, but in the water, it will stick to the belly. I don't do that. However, I take mine, turn it sideways, stab it in the belly. And that's how I swim my bait. I mentioned that with the six inch. If I want to dock skip, this belly is slit. And that hook is just laying in that slot. What I do, if I'm gonna skip docks, I've seen people rig these all sorts of ways to make them good for dock fishing. It's so much easier than that. I just open that belly slot, stick my hook in, and then I go to either the left or the right, just a little bit, and I just stab the plastic. Now it's solid, now it's in there. That's all I do, just stab it in the plastic, and there's 50 places that you can stab it in the plastic, the bait will last for weeks of dock fishing, hard dock fishing, before I need to either put a little mend it in there or a hot knife in there and start the process over. But that bait, I can shoot way back up under a dock, way back in the shade lines, and then I just slow roll it out. And those big fish that live back there in the shade, they love to hunt up. If they can pin something between them and the surface, 
they'll kill it. And the bites that happen back in the shadows, you just don't forget those bites. They're mind blowing. So that was a stellar bait for me this year. Now the big one, obviously the big one I'm gonna throw a little less often. Uh, the big one, obviously I'm imitating bigger bait fish. My biggest fish on this is a 39 pound striper. Uh, in fact, that's why this one has a giant hook upgraded on it. Uh, not just a giant hook, a giant split ring. Uh, I love throwing the big soft baits for striper too, because I don't think a lot of people do it. And those fish are brutal predators. And I love throwing that 10 inch for giant large mouth for pulling fish out, but also for targeting big stripes. Now, the weedless baits. Now you're talking, I said, if that's the spinner bait, this is like the square bill. This is a four boy, a four, blah, 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 a four by four. It'll go anywhere, do anything. Uh, we have the Magdraft Freestyle. So that bait comes unrigged. That's what you get. And actually you get two in a pack. And then I take an owner beast. And in the video description, by the way, if I haven't said this yet, I'm going to link all of these baits. This is the hardest video description I write the entire year because of the amount of baits that are in it. But I will list them in the exact order that we talked about them so that you guys can follow right along and find the baits that speak to you. So the Magdraft Freestyle is essentially that six inch Magdraft, but unrigged. And I put an owner beast on it. Uh, and you can fish it on a six aught or an eight aught. This is an eight aught, and that's typically my preference. But when you do that, you can fish it anywhere. This one is a Scottsboro. The Scottsboro, I throw the six inch and the seven inch, and same thing, eight aught beast. And these are baits that can just be thrown anywhere. Instead of going over the top of a laydown, I just plow through it. If there's reeds or bulrushes or tulies or cattails, whatever you call them in your region of the country, you could fire straight back in that stuff and just let it bump and just weave its way through that stuff. It's incredible for fishing and cover. It's really good around grass. You can go over the tops of grass. You can bust it right through grass. I think California Delta, where you've got a great big grass wall, but on the higher tides, there's like a three to five foot section of clear water behind that wall perfect for throwing up in there and getting a small little retrieve in that perfect little area and then back out over the grass and repeat. You're not picking anything off the bait because it's weedless. They're amazing for going anywhere, doing anything. The other thing I do with them a lot is fish brush piles, right? I fish on a bass boat now. When I started swim baiting, I was fishing from shore. Then I was in a 10 foot aluminum, then a 12 foot, then a bigger 12 foot, then a 14. Somewhere in there was a float tube, all before I got into my first small bass boat. And then there we went from there, right? This, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. You don't accumulate all these baits overnight. It takes time. But now I'm on a bass boat with a lot of modern technology. So if I'm fishing and I spot a brush pile on live, I can throw out there, let that bait sink, and I can fish a swim bait right through that brush where I couldn't before. Before, I had to fish a bait over the top and hope the fish would come up out of it to eat it. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. But a bait that can go right down in there and get them out is money. Now, uh, let's talk about more of those do everything type paddle tails. This is just a Kitek. That's a 6.8 Kitek. This is actually my head. That's the Matt Allen swim bait head. I clip the nose of the Kitek off and pair that head up. And that is probably the most budget option there is right there. And it will catch good ones. Uh, I pair it up to the three quarter ounce head and I can throw that thing anywhere. If my fish are deeper, like I like to do this a lot in current. Uh, here on the Tennessee River, we have a lot of current. We're on a river. So I'm on Chickamauga today. And you can throw that bait out in the current, get it down quick and then slow roll it, either a long bottom or mid column. But with a three quarter ounce lead head, uh, I can feel bottom really well, even in heavy current, because even though it's a soft swim bait, the head that's banging into things coming up the ledges 
is solid lead. So I've got really good connection to the bottom as I'm picking my way through those ledges. So that's a really good option. Hands down, the bait that just exploded for me this year, mag draft, but the other one is the Baca burrito. Mike Buca took over production of the burrito, I don't know, a year or two ago. And the, the burrito has been a custom bait forever. Gail built it, uh, still does, I think. Uh, but just an amazing bait, but there were not enough of them. And that is a common problem with swim baits. You'll find that as I talk to you about swim baits, I talk about baits that you can actually go out and get. There are a million, maybe not that many, but not that far off either, custom bait makers. There's custom baits popping up every day. And things have changed in the swim bait community in the last few years. Uh, a lot of the really good anglers have vanished. Not all of them, obviously. There's some new ones, but a lot of them have vanished because they don't want to deal with all the new stuff in the community. When I got started, if a guy was going to build a swim bait, back then it was forums, right? YouTube was kicking off, but forums is where the little bit of information that existed was located. If you wanted to make a bait and you tried to get on a forum and you couldn't show that you had personally caught a 10 pounder on that bait, you would be laughed off of there. Nobody would let anybody in who hadn't caught a 10 pounder on their own swim bait. That, that used to be the standard. Things have changed now. Now there's like anybody with a garage can build a swim bait and charge insane money for them. It's crazy. Some of those baits are great. Some of them don't work at all and they all cost a fortune. So now that's not to say I don't buy most of them. I, I mean, I am addicted to tackle. I'm addicted to gear. I'm addicted to swim baits. So I own most of them. But when most of the baits I personally fish are production baits. Uh, they're what I like. They're consistent. The baits that come out of a factory are very consistent baits. Uh, and then also they are available. It's really important to me that if I'm going to teach you about a bait and how to do it, that you can actually get that bait and that you can go out and the one that you get will do the same thing as the one that I have so that what I tell you works will work. That's really important. So a lot of what I use is very mainstream swim baits, less of the custom stuff. But again, there are so many custom baits out there and there are some really good ones and there are some not so good ones. But the burrito was one of those amazing ones. Excuse me. The burrito was a fish catcher. Mike Buca came on board, that's Bullshad Swim Baits if you're not familiar. And he connected with, with Gail and took production through the roof. So now this bait that used to be a custom is completely widely available. Uh, earlier this year, Tim and I partnered with Mike and did a completely custom tactical color. That's tactical shad. It's like an electric shad. I don't know if you can see the purple and blue hues in it but it's an electric shad blended with a Tennessee shad, hands down my favorite color. Uh, but these three are my favorite colors of the burrito. I don't even know their names, but I'll link them in the video description. But that one's like a lemon lime type color. And that one's more of a golden shad. I think that one's called Houdat, I think. But those are my three favorites. My favorite one is tactical shad. I mean, we built it for a reason. Uh, I catch so many fish on that, it's crazy. But all three of these are all chewed on. They're trashed. This one's missing an eye. This one's all full of teeth marks. They just, they catch fish. They're silicone baits, which is really nice. So they cost more than a plastisol bait, but they're silicone. They last for, if you take care of them, they last for dozens and dozens of fish. Uh, they don't kink up like normal swim baits. They don't get damaged like normal swim baits. Uh, they just last a lot longer, but silicone itself is really expensive. So they do cost more than other soft baits. But again, the burrito, there's a five inch and a six inch. And again, back in the day, 
This was like as small as you could possibly be and try to convince somebody you were throwing a swim bait. They would call that something else. That's just what regular bass fishermen throw. But the world has changed. This catches giants. Uh, I catch so many fish on the five inch, it's crazy. And I can throw it on traditional tackle. Uh, and then the six inch, it's like right on that verge. I've caught them on traditional tackle, but I prefer a dedicated swim bait rod for that. Uh, because once you hook them, if you get a big one on, you're gonna wish you had the right gear. Uh, but this bait, if you fish it slow, I can fish it on bottom. Uh, it sinks pretty quickly. So I can fish it effectively from, I think the deepest I've actually caught a fish on it was 50. But I would say it's really effective from two feet down to about 30 feet. Uh, you can throw it out and just kind of count it down. It sinks pretty quickly. There is also a medium sink. If you fish shallower water, focus on the medium sink. But this is a bait that you can throw out, count it down, and then just start winding. If you slow crawl it, it has a very minimal action, but I catch a lot of fish crawling it right on bottom. But the main deal is speeding it up, like a chuck and wind. I love throwing it for suspended fish. Throw it out, count it down, and just start winding. Dong! I mean, oh, it's unbelievable how much fun that is. It's so good. Uh, the five inch and the six inch are both great for that mid speed to even high speed fishing. And the fish just come unglued for them because it is a silicone bait. When you fish it faster, it has a really tight vibration. You can actually feel a lot of swim baits, especially wedge tails. You, you basically feel nothing. Like if you're throwing a chatter bait, thump, 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 right? Something is going on. If you're crawling a Huddleston mid column, you're just dragging a wet towel through the water. You can't feel anything until the dunk. You feel that, but nothing else. This is a bait that you actually feel it out there vibrating. And I really like that feedback. That makes it easy to throw a swim bait because you know it's doing what you want it to do. Uh, and you can cover a lot of water. This is another bait that I throw in and around docks, uh, especially on deeper docks. Uh, but I also spend a ton of time ledge fishing with it. And then also, especially in the spring when big ones are moving up, just chucking and winding. You can do anything with a burrito. Let's get through these other two and then we'll talk a little bit more about the where and how of throwing swim baits. Uh, these two are gonna be bottom contact baits. This is an Osprey, the six inch and the seven inch tournament talons. I'll keep them simple. The Osprey is a bait that I don't throw that much anymore. Uh, it has caught me so many big fish. It's caught other people so many big fish. But like I said, I kind of fall, I go through these cycles where I use baits for a long time and then I kind of get bored and I throw something else. I don't throw the Osprey that much anymore. I'm just being honest. Uh, but it is a bait that over the years has done remarkably for me. I like to fish them hard on bottom. Where these really shine for me is fishing steep stuff, steep and deep. You know, if that point breaks from 10 to 50 feet of water, I can throw that bait up there and I can just slow wind and it'll just fall right down that slope. It's really good for keeping bottom contact. The only downside is that with an Osprey, the weight is all very far forward. So when you hook a giant, this is a bait that they can spit fairly easily. Not an issue if you know it. This requires a dedicated swim bait rod. And when you hook them, you put it to them and you grind as hard and as fast as you can and the problem solved. No issue whatsoever. But if you don't know that and you don't pull hard enough, that giant bucket mouth will come to the surface and out that Osprey will come. So you need to know this is one of those baits that you stick them and you grind them. Now, in all fairness, I do that with most of the baits anyway, but that is a special bait that has caught a ton of giant fish and has a forever place in swim bait history. Uh, that's a bait that's caught them for decades and will continue to catch them. If you're going to throw them, I recommend either a white or a chartreuse shad, reverse hitch. Again, 
We'll link this stuff in the video description, but I mean, I could rattle these colors off for you. They eat them. Uh, the last one is going to be the trash fish. The six inch fatty or the big guy. These baits are weedless baits. So again, we're fishing them on a beast hook. That's an eight aught. And that is also an eight aught, but I think I would, no, it's not. No, it's not. Yeah, that's one size bigger. That's a 10 aught. The 10 aught in the big one. It sits in an open cavity in here. See that? So the hook is weedless, but it's actually just floating in there. So it collapses like nothing. So it's got a very high hookup ratio. These baits shine just creepy crawled on the bottom. This is one of those paddle tails that is actually a year round bait. Uh, most paddle tails sort of go away in the winter if you have a cold winter. Uh, I say that guys in the South, don't worry about it. There seems to be a magical number. I would say somewhere in the low fifties, 52, 53, 54, something like that, where a wedge tail just plain works better from there down. There's also a magical number on the bottom end. And I don't think most people realize that at all. For me, now every boat or every unit has a little bit of variance in it. Let's be honest, right? So on my boat, it's 37 degrees. I don't know if that's really 35, 36, 37, 38. I'm not sure. But on my boat, 100% at 37 degrees, they stop eating a swim bait. They will still eat a jig from there down to hard water. But there's something I don't know why. I don't know if it's that the water is so cold that they can't metabolize a big fish and it's just gonna sit in their gut. I don't know. But it's like clockwork. At 37 degrees, no more swim bait bite. If you wanna catch a fish, you better be throwing a jig. But from there up into the 50s, a wedge tail, and we haven't got to wedge tails yet, we're going to. Their next is amazing. And then above that, you can throw a wedge, but I love paddle tails. Paddle tails are the universal soft baits. And that's why I started with them because not everybody's gonna make it through this video, right? This is a giant and I know it, but paddle tails are the deal. Uh, they, they just perfectly imitate more things. Most bait fish, whether that's shad, shiners, something else, most bait fish have a faster tail kick, especially when they try to get away, they really speed up and they kind of flutter that tail. And it's a very unique action and a paddle style tail just does a really good job of imitating that. So they are the most universal of the baits. Uh, and the one that you should probably put the most of your time into. Now, I have caught more double digits on wedge style tails. Um, because giants are big, lazy fish and they don't want to go fast for the most part. Uh, but in terms of just going out and catching fish and catching good fish, and in most of the country, catching the biggest fish around, paddle tails are amazing. So back to this little creeper for a second longer. The beauty of this bait, I mean, it's so soft. You can just ball these things up, right? It's crazy. So even in cold water, they really don't do much kicking. If you throw this out like it's a normal swim bait and reel it back, you're gonna be so mad at me because you spent the money on it and it kind of goes through the water like this. It looks silly. This bait is meant to be on the bottom, crawled where it will bang around and have its kick and the fins move. And if a fish comes up and so much as breathes on it, it'll be moving and they mow them down. But it's not a traditional bait. You don't throw this in the places that you throw a mag draft or a burrito. You just don't do it. This is a bottom crawler, but an amazing bait for what it's for. Now, we're gonna switch over and talk wedge tails here. Let's talk a little bit more about sort of swim bait theory before we do that. Again, this is a giant video and I hope you're ready to buckle up. If you're not, I get it, you can jump through the sections, uh, but 
Today, I'm gonna do everything I can to help you guys. We know swim baits catch giant fish. A lot of people wanna know, you know, where do I throw a swim bait? That has, and when do you throw a swim bait? There's a reason we're talking about this in the fall. A swim bait can work every day of the year, but it certainly shines from about October to June. That's the height. Okay, now that's a big window. Back in the day, they used to say winter time. No, I would say October to June. Those warm water months, I mean, I catch them 12 months out of the year, but you're talking about specific baits for specific fish, right? There are baits for targeting busting fish, baits for targeting fish that are in the backs of pockets eating bluegill. If we were talking about trout eaters, that's a different animal. But that is the window that is your better time of year. If I had to pick absolute peak times to catch a monster, it's right at the fall to winter transition. Most of the country, that's end of November, very beginning of December. There are so many double digits caught right then. And then again, coming out of winter, going into the earliest of pre-spawn. So we're gonna call that in most places, end of February to mid-March. And then there's this little bonus period around the full moon in June that is also remarkable. But that's when a lot of the true monsters get caught. But that entire cooler season is big bait time. Uh, you can catch them anywhere in there. Now, as far as when to throw these, a lot of people get that wrong. I'll throw a swim bait all day every day, but I love to throw swim baits in the heat of the day. If you are on a lake where they're eating trout and kokanee, if you're a guy out west, uh, if you're a guy in the eastern mountains where they're stalking trout, and anywhere in the middle, if they eat trout, middle of the day, 10 to two, that's your window. The reason why is that trout eaters are lazy fish. The fish that eat trout, they eat trout, period. They don't chase other things, they eat trout. 10 to two, the sun is the highest. These are ambush predators. They'll sit under docks. They'll sit on the bottom and look up. Uh, they'll sit out on the ends of long tapering points. They'll sit where they can be behind a boulder and eat things that come around it. They're ambush predators. At the peak of the day, they can see the farthest. It's easier for them to hunt. Now, most people aren't throwing big baits then, so you already have an advantage. Granted, you're not the only person who just heard that, uh, but you have a huge advantage. That is a key time. Look, if you, can, if you know anyone who's caught a teener, okay, not a 10 pounder, a teener, a 13 plus, more than 90% of teeners are caught in the middle of the day on a bluebird sky. Now, there are some caught at night too. That's a different animal. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that if you look at the backgrounds of photos of teeners, you're gonna see blue sky. That's because the true giants are lazy ambush predators and it's easier for them when they can see. Now, that's harder for you. The reason why is they can see. They can see you. They can see the line, they can see the hooks, they can see flaws in the bait, right? That's when everything is in their favor, not in your favor, but that's when they feed. So that is your window. 10 to two is prime time giant hunting. Now, the rest of the country, places that don't have trout and kokanee or that's not the main forage, it's much broader, but I still love that exact same time period. The reason why is that bass at the heat of the day like shadows. They pull up into shadow lines, they sit under docks, they sit up against cover. This time of the morning, a bass could be anywhere on this bank, right? And I'm just covering water, hoping I cross that fish. This isn't like specific dialed in swim baiting where I've set up on a point and I've got my angle and I get my big bait and I make my one perfect cast, let it go to bottom and I take three minutes to get it back to the boat and then don't, there she is. This is literally 
spinner rate fishing. I take my paddle tail and I'm just going down the bank, trying to cross paths with one that's up feeding. Once that sun is up, there's a lay down right here. There's a lay down way down there. There's one down there. I know this bank, there's nothing else here. It's like gravel and mud, there's nothing here. I know where my fish will be when the sun is high because they're going to want to be up against cover. That's the only shade on this bank. It's the only place to hide where they can ambush from. So the places that I'm targeting get much smaller during high sun, even in a place that's shad or bluegill or anything else oriented. So generally speaking, midday is the deal. Now nighttime is its own ball game. Plenty of big ones get caught at night. We're not talking about that today, uh, but I'll tell you what, all these same baits still apply. You just go out there in the dark and start slinging. Uh, let's talk wedge tail soft baits, then bluegill soft baits, then I'm gonna have to change the, the battery in this camera and we'll keep right on rolling. Wedge tails. You can't talk wedge tails without talking Huddleston. A wedge style tail, as opposed to a paddle style tail, is a completely different action. Paddles tend to have a wide, broad kick, a lot more flicker to them. Much better at imitating a bait fish. A wedge style tail is much more subtle. Much better at imitating a trout. Very, very subtle. The beauty of a wedge is that it works at any speed. If you go really fast, they kick a little broader. If you go insanely slow, like so slow the bait is hardly even moving across the bottom, every time it bumps something, even here in my hand, that tail moves. It's doing the same thing in the water. The most subtle kick you can imagine, but this bait stays upright and it has that subtle kick and they eat it. Even as I'm sitting here looking at this bait, you can see the teeth marks in the side of that bait. They eat it. The Huddleston was the bread and butter of swim baits for a lot of years. I caught my biggest bass on an eight inch ROF 12 rainbow trout Huddleston. She went 17.2 pounds. That's my big one. Uh, I think she's the biggest one I ever hooked, I think. I've lost some other teeners. I've lost a bunch of teeners. <laughs> we have some videos telling some of those stories from back in the day, but man, I have lost some big ones. But I think that I landed the biggest one that I ever got, but it came on a Huddleston. Uh, now, trout and kokanee is where you're going to see me throw this tail the most, but I will still throw it in the springtime or cold water coming out of winter I lean to those wedge tails a lot, even in lakes that don't have trout and kokanee, because they'll move at the slowest of speeds. And these days, there are a lot of really good options that didn't exist before. Another one is the Savage Gear. The Savage Gear RTF baits, they make a six, an eight, and a 10, but the eight is by far my favorite. I love this color right here. I think that's called Dirty Silver. Again, sometimes when it comes out of my mouth, it's not right, but I think it is. But in the video description, it's always right. I fact check it before I put it there. But this is a bait that I crush with. Uh, what I love about them is they come rigged already. So it's already got a stinger hook on it. One thing about a stinger hook, because this is the first time it's come up in this video, giant fish. I'm teaching you literally how to catch the biggest fish in your lake. I'm hoping that you are an honorable person and you are going to take care of those fish. Uh, giant fish are special. It takes a really long time for them to get big. Uh, the best thing that you can do is get those fish in the boat, be gentle with them, get pictures. If you want a replica, get a very quick measurement. If you don't have a measuring tape, don't throw that fish in your live well and drag it around all day. Here's a trick for you. Grab your nearest reel, stretch that line out, Lay it down next to the fish, cut it. Now you have her length. Grab the next section of line, reach it around her body, cut it, roll them up, stick them in your pocket. You have a length and a girth 
take a picture, take a picture with the fish, take a picture on the deck. You have enough to get a replica done. You don't even need to have a tape measure with you. You don't even need another person with you. You're good to go. But be very careful with these giant fish because they do need to be taken care of. These are the grandparents of fish. It's very easy to hurt a fish over 10 pounds. When you get them out of water, they're not used to all that weight being out of water, right? It weighs more, it's pulling on them. Their organs are shifting. Uh, so the less time you have them out of water, the better. The sooner you can get them home, the better. Again, I can't tell you what to do, and I am giving you the tools to catch absolute giants, but I'm hoping you do the right thing with them. Another thing to keep in mind is that less hooks on your bait, the better. Especially with soft baits. Not as big of a deal with hard baits because if they come up and T-bone this, they can't actually get it all the way in their mouth. It's very rare that they'll take a hard bait all the way down. Once in a while they do, but it's very rare. Soft baits on the other hand, soft baits just completely fold up and go in the gullet. So if you are going to run a stinger hook, it is so much better for the fish that you run it on the back rather than on the belly. Now, obviously a mag draft, a B5, these are baits that have a belly treble, but they only have one and it's towards the front of the bait and I keep it that way. I will never run a double stinger system on the belly of a soft bait. Uh, I'm not saying I haven't. I learned some hard lessons. Don't do that. <laughs> Run them on the back because it's far more likely that if they take the bait deep, that your stinger will end up in the roof of the mouth rather than down in the gills. Catching giants is amazing. Having one die on your watch is the worst feeling. The worst feeling. So I'm trying to save you that. Stinger on the back will still hook almost all of them It'll put it in the roof and you can reach in there with pliers, take it right out, no harm, no foul. So that came up just because this is the first bait with a stinger on it. Now, I'm gonna throw you a bone here. This bait comes stock with a stinger. I brought this one on purpose. This is a really solid setup for fish up to like five or six pounds. And, and I mean, you could catch a monster on it, but I brought this one for a reason. It's kinked and twisted, and I have a bent out point. It's not bent out by much. Oh, but it's bent out. And that one hurt me. I lost a big one on this particular bait back in spring. And I thought, I don't know when I'm gonna talk swim baits again, but I'm just setting this bait aside so that I can talk about it. This is a great rig. I'll still fish them stock, but if I'm fishing a place where I think I can catch a giant, I've replaced my entire stinger setup. I've done it myself. It's a wire setup and I've replaced my hook. That's an owner ST56. That's a three X hook. Owner ST56 size two held on with a haywire twist on single strand wire. I brought the wire. There's no excuse not to use this stuff. It costs like three or four bucks. I mean, it's cheap. 174 pound is my main wire. 140, 124. The reason why I don't just have all 174 pound is because uh, the stronger the wire, the more rigid it gets. So if you try to take that wire and put it on a little bluegill, it'll kind of bugger it up. So the smaller the bait, the lighter the wire. Just know that the lighter the wire, the more often you're gonna replace it. If a fish kinks it, just cut it off and redo it. A haywire twist is so easy. I literally do it with my hands. And then take my snips, clip the end. Go to the other end, put it through my hook, bend it over, do my wraps, Clip it, done. It's bulletproof. 
Uh, I'm not going to show you how to do it today. This video is plenty long without it, but I have a dedicated video on how to rig swim baits that Tim and I did in the past. I will link that video in the description for you. Uh, so that if you're interested in learning how to do a haywire twist or do stinger hooks properly so that you don't lose fish, I don't do crimps, I don't do braid, I do haywire twist on single strand wire because everything else can fail. And with crimps, it takes time to learn how to do it. You over crimp, they're brittle, they break. You under crimp, they slip. And you learn those things by losing fish. I'm not about that. So again, we'll link that video for you. But this gear, this bait, the Savage Gear 8 inch is a deadly bait. I have blasted them on this bait. I've also blasted them on the bigger 10 inch. I just, day in and day out around the country, eight inches is, is just like I said, the eight inch mag draft. That's just the sweet spot for ultimate drawing power and fish ability and fish choking the bait. But I had a great big one two years ago, right when we got to Chickamauga, we first moved here. I went out throwing a 10 inch bait, just the 10 inch savage gear, just trying to pull fish just to see what was here. And I had a monster come out and just engulf that thing. It was unreal. Make no mistake they will massacre a big bait. Now, we'll wrap up the wedge tails here. I've got three more for you, and then I'm gonna change the battery because I've already been going for a while. The wedge tails, those were trout and kokanee imitators. Six to seven inch, that's your shad type Im imitator. So the Huddleston 68, where it's the eight inch tail on the six inch bait, tons of exaggerated kick. It's a good shad imitator. The mat lures, the mat lures shad is a killer bait. I caught a giant in Texas on this bait. I've caught a lot of other fish on it. Uh, just a killer little bait. This one has a little smaller wedge for the size of the bait. So it has a nice tight kick like a shad. But if you're in lakes that have gizzard shad or have shiners, these are really good baits because they're true profiles. They have a great kick, but it's still a wedge tail which can be fished in really cold water, either mid column or on the bottom. Then the last one is this Savage Gear Shiner. Again, line through, so you can put your treble on the belly if you're fishing mid column, or you can put it on the back if you're just going to crawl the bait. If you put it on the back, the bait is less stable. It will want to roll more often, but if it's belly, it's perfectly stable, has an awesome little kick, and it looks really, really good. And with that, we wrap up wedge tails. Let's take a second here and then we'll do bluegill soft baits. That was a close one. We were just seconds away from no more battery on that camera. Now let's talk bluegill soft baits. And then I'm gonna talk just a couple of quick rods. Then we'll go bluegill hard baits. We're into hard baits. Things will speed up from here. Bluegill are probably the number one forage of bass in terms of swim bait fishing, the number one forage of bass around the country. Because I grew up in the West, it was my smallest category. It was mostly trout and kokanee eaters out there for me on the lakes I was on. That changed later once I got on the Delta and Clear Lake, but the bluegill came late for me. Now, imitating bluegill is easy. You just do it in some different places. You don't think like a bass that eats a trout or an open water fish. So typically I don't throw bluegill baits way out off the tips of long tapering points. Typically I don't throw them in open water praying to call fish up off the bottom. I'm going to throw these baits around where bluegill live. Docks, heavy cover, grass, backs of coves, backs of pockets, grass edges, the edges of cheese mats, places that bluegill live. And that's all there is to it, it's simple. I almost always fish in middle of the column. Now you can bump bottom with them too, but these are baits that you can just throw out and roll back. With my soft baits, I personally throw all wedge style tails. I just really like the way they kick. Uh, you've already seen today the Savage Gear line through, okay? That's number one, an amazing little kick. I could rig it either way, but again, I typically rig it with the belly treble. There's the tiny Savage Gear with the jig hook. I love that little guy. 
that little guy has caught me a pile of fish because they just wolf it. Again, that's a bait that you can throw on just a regular rod. You can throw it on a medium heavy or a heavy rod, you know, a seven foot to a seven six and just go. Just throw it on lighter line, 10, 12, 15, whatever, and they will just eat it. You just throw it and wind it back. Dong! They just eat that little guy. Uh, if you're a pond guy, this is a killer bait. Now there is crossover for guys that sight fish with bluegill baits too. And these are all great baits for that too. But I'm talking about year round fishing. Uh, in the fall, there's a lot of downsized bluegills, small baby bluegills, baby crappie that get corralled by big bass. Um, they'll corral them into backs of marinas or backs of pockets, just like they would shad. And that's a killer size for imitating that. And this is a Savage Gear. And I rig this guy on actually a very large beast. And look how I bent my hook. Do you see that? That's how I get the hookup ratio I want out of this bait. If I left it stock and I put it in here, this bait's hollow. It's got a big empty cavity in it. So I could just take it and put it right through. Again, this is that 13 fishing coalition bait right up through the back. If I left it stock, the hook is tipped down into the back and they really have to eat it good for me to be able to stick them. I bend it so that there's that hook point. See it? As soon as I put any pressure, out comes that hook, just ready to stick. I really like that. Now, anytime you bend out a hook, you just know you've got to keep a lot of pressure on those fish if you want to get them in the boat. But I love that bent out point for fishing that one. And then last is the mat lures. Mat lures was the first of the really good bluegill imitators. I had one of the very first ones he ever, ever made. And let me tell you, he has come a long way. His new baits are phenomenal, full fins. I love the wedge style tail on that bait. That is a fish catcher. Uh, I've caught big ones on them. I've had clients catch monsters on them. I have one clip that I use a lot of one of my clients catching an 11 pounder on a mat lures. It's the fastest fight of all time. From the time the fish ate to the time she was in the net. I, I, it's been a while since I looked, but I want to say it was like three seconds or something. It was unreal. Great big monster bass on Clear Lake on a mat lures. Just a killer, killer bait. Now, Again, with all these soft baits, I talked about how some of them need dedicated rods, but some can be thrown on lighter gear. And this is the lighter gear that I use. Uh, this is a Shimano X-Pride 7.7 Heavy. It's a phenomenal all around rod. That 7.7 is long enough that it really loads up on fish, uh, but it's a misleadingly soft rod in the tip. So again, it really loads up, but tons of backbone. Uh, and it's been a great bait for throwing, or great rod for throwing soft baits. In fact, I did not put that on there. That was already on there. It's five inch burrito. And then this one, this is a Mega Bass P5. And this guy, uh, the Tequila Baccarat, is a killer. Uh, it's a misleading rod. It's a seven foot rod. Let me read you the ratings of this rod. Seven foot, three quarter, to four ounce, 12 to 30 pound. What kind of rating is that? But they're not wrong. This rod, it's soft in the tip so it can throw light stuff. It has crazy backbone so it can throw heavy stuff. Uh, think of it as like a do-all travel type rod. You take that thing on the road with you, you can throw a five inch bait, you can throw an eight inch mag draft, you could throw a bluegill bait, um, you can also turn around and throw a glide bait on it. It'll do a lot of different things on a traditional platform. Uh, and then this reel is incredible too. That guy, that Bantam, that reel is just an absolute workhorse. Uh, I've been so impressed with it. They did the gearing in this reel specifically for torque. So it's easier to turn the handle under load uh, and it makes a difference. I really, really like that rod for hooking big fish. Um, and then actually, I'm so glad this is on here. This is a trick that I use that I don't usually talk about, uh, but this is a mag draft freestyle. So it's this bait, the six inch mag draft freestyle. 
and I clip the face off and I put them on either a three quarter or a one ounce jig head, just like I did that Kitech. This is a one ounce blade runner and I fish these deep. So I was using this the other day fishing in 30 to 50. I was actually striper fishing on that particular day, uh, but these striper were in deep water in current and I'm able to get a mag draft and the head completes the profile. Like it's just part of the bait. And I'm able to really effectively fish that bait super deep. And I'm talking like swimming it in 30 to 50 feet of water and then just, they just destroy it. Uh, but again, I wanted to show you those rods uh, because you don't always need that heavy, heavy swim bait gear with some of these smaller baits. The bigger baits, you absolutely do. And we will circle back on that. But let's talk, we're switching gears now to hard baits. Uh, we'll talk bluegill first and we'll go from there. This shouldn't take near as long, I hope. I grabbed five bluegill hard baits. All of them are different and that's why I grabbed five. I want you to listen to what I use each one for and just choose the one that fits your style. It's that simple. No particular order. The Ganterell is up first. The Ganterell was the first bluegill profiled bait that really worked for me because traditionally i would take glide baits like an s waver in a bluegill color and i would just fish that and i caught so many fish doing that but bluegill profiles have come a long ways all those really tall really big hard bluegill baits i will not use i just won't use them the bluegill is a difficult shape for a bass to eat in the real world if they try to eat bluegill, every once in a while, you'll see a bass floating out there dead or dying. They always have a bluegill stuck in their mouth. It's a difficult profile for them to eat. Uh, so it's really important to me that a bluegill profile be narrow top to bottom. Not just because it's hard to eat, it's hard to hook up. If the bait's really tall, the fish just bounce off it more often than they hook up. And I'm, I'm not into doing all this work and trying to catch a giant fish just to have the fish bounce off the bait. I'm not about that. So the Ganterelle is an amazing profile. It's a bluegill type body, but it's slimmed top to bottom. Hookup ratio is excellent. This is actually a floating bait. And the Ganterelle, I fish unlike any other bait. The Ganterelle, most hard baits, you're gonna hear me talk about it as we go, I work them and I twitch them. The Ganterelle is the opposite. I slow swim and I pause. I don't twitch, I pause. The bait will be doing its little thing. As soon as you start to turn the handle, it's subsurface. Even though it's a floating bait, this is not a wake bait, this is a subsurface bait. The hard fins are angled on the sides and it just makes it go down like a crankbait lip. So it'll fish one to three feet below the surface. Shallow water bait. Steady retrieve, it'll get this great little kick to it or great little swim to it. And then I pause and when I pause, it just sort of wanders off. And that's the key action with this bait. So swim, 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 stop. And it'll, and then I keep swimming. And off it goes. That little drift away is a catcher and other baits don't do it. It's really unique and I've done so well with it. The one thing that's weird is that because it's drifting away when they eat it, a lot of the bites are on semi slack line. So you'll barely feel them. It'll like, it'll start to drift off and then you're like, I think that was a tick. Oh, that's a fish. Once in a while, full freight train. They hit it head on, full freight train but a lot of times the bites will surprise you unlike these other soft baits, uh, but such a cool bait. Next one, let's go right here. This is the only glide in the mix. This is the bait sanity. This little bluegill, this little bluegill glide is a killer. This is the slow sink. That's the one I like the most. It's an amazing little glide. It's got perfect action. You can twitch it really well, hard snaps, uh, it's an amazing little bait. I, there's not more than that to say about it. If you want a glide bait in a bluegill profile, that is my pick. Uh, they did an amazing job of keeping it full profile. Like look at the chubby cheeks. 
It's a full profile bait, but look, no fins to bounce off of. They're really minimal fins. Nothing for the hooks to catch on on the bottom. Uh, it's done really well, and the action is phenomenal for a glide. Very impressed with that bait. Um, the mat lures, multi-joint bait. For me, this is a steady retrieve bait with the occasional pauses or the occasional pops. So I don't twitch it like I do a glide bait, but I'll pull it. So I'll like real, real, real pull, real, real, real pull, real, real, real pull, or real, real stop, real, real stop, real, real stop, but not the long pauses of a ganterel. Okay. This is sort of the in-betweener. It's a fast fishing bait, but I can also just do like a medium and it's just got a really good swim. Killer little bait. This guy is the other end of the spectrum. This is the bull gill, okay? So Mike Buka, bull shad, this is the bull gill. And this guy is my burner. Same as that Matt Lures, but even faster. Burn, 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 stop. Burn, 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 stop. Burn, 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 stop. Twitch, twitch, burn, twitch, twitch, twitch. Burn, 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 stop. Pure aggression, pure speed, pure power, and I'm looking for fish to unload on it. If they're in a lethargic mood, if they're in a funk, this is not my bait. I'm slow rolling a soft bait, or I'm just barely playing games with the ganterel, right? Just working it over them. But if they're aggressive, if they're chasing, if they're in a bad mood and they just seem to be killing things on that particular day, pure power, pure speed, run it over the tops of cover, pause, run, pause, run, pause, get right up to a piling, pause, and they just unload on it. And then again, the mat lures is somewhere in between. And then last but not least is the Vitalian. I include this one in most of my swim bait videos, even though it's not really a swim bait. I don't know what to call it, but you need to throw it. The Vitalian is like halfway between a swim bait and a crankbait. If you just steady retrieve it, it just is coming through the water. It's got this like body shake to it, much like a crankbait, but it's got that tail back there kicking. The Vitalian has done so much damage for me. Uh, large mouth, small mouth, <laughs> peacock bass. I've caught so many things on Vitalians, it's unreal. I love this bait. Uh, it's my favorite bait for fishing in the jungle. If you go to South America, the Vitalian is my favorite bait. I love it, but I love it here too. Uh, I've caught some big old smallmouth on a Vitalian. But the way I fish this bait is aggressive and then pause. Burn it, stop. Burn, stop. Burn, stop. Uh, it's short burst, so it'll psh. Now, if you fish it stock, she's gonna wanna float up. If you upgrade your hooks, because these are 1X hooks that come stock on it. If you upgrade to 3X hooks, she's gonna wanna sink. Both are okay. I fish both. I like heavy hooks, so I typically fish 3X hooks on it. But burn it, and it's, and then it cuts off. Burn, cuts off, burn, cuts off. And it has this kick out every time you stop. And when it kicks out, they crush that thing. So much fun. It's a crossover bait. It's not quite a swim bait, but it's closer to a swim bait than anything else. Okay, multi-joint baits. Now we're kind of switching gears. These are those true shad and herring type imitators. Baits that you fish fast, baits that you fish aggressive. Number one in this category is the bull shad. This is a bait that you burn. Speed is your friend. Just like the bull gill, burn this bait. Fish it around really shallow cover. Fish it really fast, stop and go. On the days where they're angry, they will come out and just let it have it. But it is a fantastic imitator of big shad or shiners, any of those big profiled bait fish, but just burn, 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 pause, burn, 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 pause, burn, pause, burn, 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 burn. You want them to come out and unload on it. I fish these multi-joint baits the least. I love fishing glides, but these absolutely have a place. 
shad and also herring, lakes with herring in them. Multi-joint baits going fast are amazing in open water for giant spotted bass. The triple trout. The triple trout is one of the original multi-joint baits. They've been around forever, completely unchanged. Same deal, this is a bait that you can fish really fast, but it's also got, it's got less joints in it. You can also slow it down. It has a good swim, kind of like that Matt Lures bluegill, the in-betweener. It's got a really good swim, but you can speed it up and burn them too, that exact same retreat. The triple trout is one of those baits that has just been proven for decades. Uh, last but not least is a new one. This is the Shimano Arma Joint. This bait actually floats, but as soon as you start to work it, it wants to go subsurface, like the Ganterelle. Uh, it's got flash boost in it, which is something we've been playing with in jerk baits for the last year, and it's mind blowing how good it works. But when I look at this bait, the first thing I think is herring lakes. So again, this bait works great on a burn. Just hauling and then pausing, hauling, pausing. The joint on it is crazy. Look at this. <laughs> Total motion in the joint. It's a very, very unique profile. So when you burn it and pause it, I mean, it can truly fold up out there. Uh, and it also folds up completely on the cast, so you get really good distance out of it. Very unique bait. The second I saw it, I thought Herring Lake. That's where that thing's gonna shine. It's also done really well for me as a twitch bait on the surface. Uh, because it does float, I can just barely work it and it'll, it'll dance and play games on the surface. Not quite in my wake bait category, um, because it's a little smaller bait, little smaller hardware. I throw it on lighter line. Again, I throw this on a traditional rod, not a swim bait rod. All those others were swim bait rod. Uh, it's just a little bit smaller, a little bit lighter, but a very unique bait. Now, we're gonna talk glide baits. Man, I love glide baits. That, for the last few years, until this year, glide baits have been my baby. Uh, I spend more time throwing a glide than everything else combined. Uh, it didn't used to be that way. It used to be wedgetail soft baits. Then it, it switched over to glide baits for a lot of years. And now I'm telling you, for me these days, it's paddle tails. I have had this complete resurgence of paddle tails in my fishing, but the amount of time I've spent with glide baits over the years and the amount of giant fish we've caught is freakish. I just naturally go through these cycles where I wanna do something different. I know what it's like to catch a big one on a glide bait. I've been blessed to do it a bunch. I wanna catch them another way. I wanna skip soft baits under docks, right? I just change. So glide baits, we can split them into two categories. You've got what I call open water glides and cover glides. Size of the bait has a lot to do with that. Action ultimately dictates it. Open water glide baits are baits with the bigger, wider swims. Very wide swim. They typically don't twitch that well, uh, especially in the custom baits. Really big custom baits, you just have to slow roll them. Because if you try to twitch them, they just do goofy things. They just don't work right. But on that slow roll, the drawing power of a monster glide is crazy. You can pull fish in a clear Western reservoir. You throw a 10 or 12 inch glide, you can pull the bass off the bottom in 30 and 40 feet of water. It's remarkable. They will come farther for a glide than literally anything else. Uh, I don't know what it is about that action, but they just do. So not only as a fish catcher, but as a fish locator, they're amazing baits. I like with my open water glides, my open water glides, I like production baits. The reason why is that they're slightly smaller. They've got great wide glide, but I can also twitch them and work them. And the price is right. So first one, the Bait Sanity Explorer. That is an amazing bait. The Bait Sanity Explorer is a budget bait for its size, right? Swim baits are not cheap. 
but it's a budget bait for its size uh, and is an amazing bait. It has a fantastic swim, really wide glide, but it can also be twitched. Now, the reason why that twitch is so critical, a big monster glide draws fish up. That's great, that's well and good. But after that, you have to catch them. They have to come up and then decide, yes, I want to eat this and then chomp it. If you've got a bait that can twitch, you can draw a feed response out of the fish. Just like when we're burning a bluegill bait, burn, stop, burn, stop. That's drawing a feed response. It's getting the fish to chase. With a great big glide, you slow work that bait in open water. Pull the fish to the bait. Again, I want these in open water. I don't want these around cover because I need them to come over distance. It's that large swim pulls over distance. We have cover glides. We're going to get to that if you're fishing shallower or tighter to cover. Once the fish come up and they get near the bait, I use two twitches. The first twitch breaks the cadence. The second twitch snaps it back. What I believe that does, I mean, I know exactly what it does. It makes the fish either crush it or let it go. But what I believe causes that is that the fish is following because they're hardwired to do so. When they get in close, they're interested. They're thinking about it. When it does the twitch and it turns, there's eye contact here, right? This fish is now busted by its prey. He either needs to do something or let it go. Next twitch, when it's a hard move, that is this bait fish making a run for it. Now granted, I'm only doing the two twitches. I'm not going anywhere from there. But in that twitch, when it starts to run, this fish is either gonna blast it or turn it loose. That's it. So you can actually get them to lash out and feed when they otherwise wouldn't if the bait will twitch. That is why I like some of these production open water baits. The next one, you guys know we love that G-Rat Sneaky Pete. This is the bigger one, that's the Papa Pete. Comes in some killer colors, comes with really strong stock hardware. Uh, it's a really interesting bait. What I love about the Sneaky Pete and the Papa Pete is they can be fished at multiple speeds. It's a great open water glide, a great big wide swim. It's a very slow sinker, whereas the bait Sanity sinks a fair bit quicker. So this I'm fishing either shallower or I'm wanting to pull those fish all the way up. I can fish it crazy slow. This one I can fish a little quicker or I can count it down. So I'll throw these a lot, like I've pulled fish off the tops of humps in 20, 25 feet of water with this by letting it sink down 10 and then pulling the fish up to meet it. I can't do that with the papa. The papa wants to stay high in the water, but as a result, you can really play and you can really go slow. You can do twitches and just let it glide and really play games with it. Uh, to get those fish to react, but you can also fish this bait fast. Uh, the guys that make these baits, the G-Rat guys, they river fish a lot. So they've built a bait that also fishes really well in current. If you're a striper guy, you know I'm speaking to you. Uh, striper guys, guys that are fishing rivers for bass, uh, anywhere that you've got current, Tennessee River, where I live, here on Chickamauga or Gunnersville, where you've got a lot of flow, a bait that can handle that is a hard bait to find. Uh, and these, these baits do it really well. So that Papa Pete is a killer open water bait. Then we've got the Gancraft 230, which is probably the most overlooked of the glide baits. Gancraft, I've talked about them for years. Tim and I both talk about them. The Gancraft was one of, if not the very first mainstream glide bait. Uh, and it does not get the credit that it deserves. It was an amazing bait then, it's an amazing bait now, and somehow it just doesn't have that mainstream credit uh, that it has coming to it. I've caught so many giants on a Gancraft. It's an amazing bait. If you wanna try 
a little bit higher end bait, that's a killer option. Uh, and then again, that larger size has that really good wider swim to it. And it, this one twitches extremely well. Like you can really snap it and it's got really good dart to it. I really like that bait. And then last but not least is the S Waver 200. That's the smallest of my open water glide baits. Uh, and it's also one that I've caught the most true giants on. I've caught so many big fish on an S Waver 200. Uh, stock hardware is great. You can fish it on 1X trebles. I also upgrade. Those are upgraded to 3X trebles. It just depends on how fast I want that bait to sink and the size of fish I think are going to eat it. Uh, but when I upgrade my hooks like that, I can get a little faster sink out of the bait and I can fish it more effectively in deeper water. Uh, here where I live now, I don't have tons of crystal clear water. I've got a lot of like, I don't know, three to five foot of is. So a bait that I can get down a little bit closer to the fish pulls them a little bit better. And the S waiver, even though it's an open water bait, it doesn't have this glide like a bait sanity does. It's more of like this glide. It's like the in-betweener. And that works really well when I don't have as much visibility. The more visibility, the farther they're coming in clear water, the wider the glide so that the bait goes slower, gives them time to get there. But this is a killer, killer bait. Now, switching to cover glides. I promised we would go a little bit quicker. I think we're speeding up. I know this is a lot of information, but again, you don't need all of those baits. You know whether your water is on the murkier end or the clearer end. You know if you want a bait that you can twitch really hard or not. Just choose the one that fits your style. Cover glides, I've got five of them here because I just couldn't narrow it down. This is a category where it's like pick your poison, but these are all fairly affordable baits. Uh, so. Pick more than one if you want to, but they're all such good baits. First one is that S Waver 168. We talked about it as a beginner bait. This one has been thrashed. This one, let me show you, here's a new one. Well, he's not even new. He's been beat up a little bit, but that's how they start out looking. This is how they look when fish have just mangled them. I regret to say that you'll never see this one again because kids, you shouldn't bet your friends I bet a buddy that there wasn't a bait fish in a particular lake and I was wrong and I lost one of my favorite S waivers. I've yet to give it to him, but this bait no longer belongs to me. I need to start thrashing another S waiver bluegill. But that S waiver is an amazing, amazing bait. Uh, the G-Rat Sneaky Pete that we just talked about, smaller than the Papa Pete, is an amazing in between bait. It's got a good glide. It's got a very robotic action, which speaks to fish. That injured look speaks to fish. This bait's amazing in current. You can go fast with it in current, or you can fish it slow like a glide bait. Twitches really well, and it's actually a really loud bait, which has a time and a place. I love sound. A lot of people spend all their time trying to get their glide baits silent, right? They put pads in the joints. They do all sorts of different things to try and silence them. I don't care about any of that. I like some racket. I want some fish to find that bait. Now, if I was trying to catch a 19 pounder in a SoCal pond that only eats trout, that's a different ball game. But I wouldn't do that with a glide bait anyway because there's too much hardware hanging there and she's gonna see it. But generally speaking, around the country, murkier water, some sound is a good thing. I love multi-joint baits that are banging and clacking. Those baits are loud coming through the water. So is this. They can find it and they will pound on that bait. It's a really, really good bait. The Storm Arashi, another killer budget bait that just catches them. Has a really good action to it, really good slow swim, and it's got a good twitch. I like that bait a lot. The Bait Sanity Antidote comes in a slow sink and a super slow sink. So if you're fishing dirt shallow, because some places are just plain shallow, especially like fall drawdown, your docks might only be in 18 inches of water. A bait that's gonna 
land up there and sink a little bit, it'll already stick to bottom. That slow sink or the super slow is a killer option. This is that summer shad color. Love that color. And then the last one is the most expensive. And again, it's a Gamecraft 178. If you want to try a higher end bait, more refined, prettier paint job, that's a killer option. Especially if you wanna support one of the brands that brought a lot of this innovation, right? We don't wanna jump over the brands that created these categories. So I, I just always try to pay respect to Gancraft because that's one of those original innovating companies. Uh, again, you're gonna spend more for them. That's an imported bait, uh, but they're refined. They're really nice. Let's talk wake baits. Then, we're, oh, you know what, let's back up. Because I talked really quickly about the baits, but not what makes them so special. Cover glides. The key to the cover glide is fishing it around cover. If you take a cover glide, you throw it out in 40 feet of water. <laughs> Sometimes they do work, but it's not ideal because the bait is going too fast. The action is too narrow for fish to come distance to get it. Cover, gu cover glides shine around cover. I fish them in say less than eight feet of water, seven feet of water, and I fish them around cover. Be that laydowns, be that brush, grass edges, docks, boulders, tips of points, but I wanna fish it where I think I know the fish is. So I'm gonna use a dock piling as an example again, because it's such a good example. If you throw the bait past and you start working it, we already talked about how those twitches work, where the fish bust it and then they either commit or let it go. If I throw it way past the dock piling and I'm swimming up to the piling and I do my twitches out here, that makes no sense because the fish is gonna be by the piling, most likely, right? There might be one out there, but most likely I know where the fish is. She's on the piling. So I just slow swim up to and past the piling. Right as I get past the piling, I need to give it a couple of feet because if there was a fish on a shallow piling, it's gonna take her just a second to pop up. So a couple feet past the piling, I do my twitches. Because I'm envisioning the fish on the piling, she comes off the piling to look at the bait, I do my twitches and boom, she eats it. I love to fish a cover glide around cover because I'm seeing it happen. Even if the water's not clear where I'm physically seeing it, in my mind, I'm seeing it. I see the piece of cover, I come up, I do my thing, boom, there they are. That is so satisfying. That's so much more fun than just blindly casting in open water. It's unreal. You can totally play games with these fish. Picture the cover, throw by the cover, twitch it at the right moment, lights out. So much fun. All right, let's talk wake baits. Many of you know, some of you don't, that Tim and I came out with a wake bait this year. We partnered with River to Sea. We built the Tactical 210 wake. This is a bait that we worked on quietly for years, years. And then we sat on the project for years to get the cost where we wanted it, where it would be affordable for people. Ooh, got myself. Comes in a variety of colors. You know, trout has, the trout is the only one that has this style of tail. We did this style of tail because it's true to a trout. You don't put a big fork tail on a trout. So River to Sea tooled up a second tail just for trout. The rest of them have a big fork. I believe so much in an exaggerated fork tails. Uh, it looks so good on a wake. But we designed a wake bait to do all the things we wanted out of a wake. There's still some other great wake baits out there and we will forever continue to test baits and always bring you the best. Even when we have a bait in the market, we don't care. We only put a bait in the market because it needed to be there. We needed to fill a spot. I have always believed that the best big fish wake baits, big fish baits are single joint, lipped, soft tailed. That's what the biggest fish eat. It has an injured action about it, and it just, for whatever reason, triggers a feed response in the monsters. I've seen it for years, so I knew that if we ever did a build, that's what we wanted to do. 
we spent a ton of time with his bait trying to create a bait that would do something very unique. We wanted a bait that had an amazing swim and we got it. An amazing sound and we got it. But I also wanted a bait that could be walked. So you can throw this out, slow roll it. It has an amazing swim. This tail, the water line will sit on this tail and that tail is just up there above the water just doing its thing. It looks so good. I also wanted a bait that could be twitched and walked because when it gets choppy on a calm morning, I like to slow roll, fish it really slow, little pauses. But when there's chop on the water, when there's wind, when there's waves, there's boat wakes, I walk the bait, pop, 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 pop. And it will dance, almost like walking the dog. It's loud, it's aggressive, and fish will unload on it in waves. We also wanted a bait that be, could be crawled at the absolute slowest speeds possible. And we achieved that. I won't go into the details on how we achieved that, but we achieved that. This bait will swim slower than any other build wake bait. It's unbelievable how slow you can go and maintain that swim because some mornings the lake is glass and pushing a V wake is too much. You just want to crawl and stop crawl, stop, and it works for that too. We wanted a bait that would do it all, and we achieved that. I'm so proud of that bait. That said, no bait is perfect for every situation. I actually forgot one of my wakes. I was bound to forget something. I meant to bring Buka's bull wake. It's a smaller bait. It is a single joint, lipped, soft tail. It's a great bait, and it's a much smaller profile than the tactical wake. The tactical wake is a big bait. We did this on purpose. It's because we wanted to force your hand, honestly. That's why we did it. Because we knew that if we made one a little smaller, we could sell them for less money and we could sell more of them because people would be willing to try it. But I also knew less giants would get caught on them. And we actually want you to succeed. We want you catching monster bass. So this is the exact size that I think will get you the biggest bite. And it's still small enough to catch big ones. But there are guys that are just afraid to throw the big bait, and I get it. I just wasn't willing to bend to make a bait that I thought would ultimately catch you a smaller bass. Uh, but there are great baits out there that will catch a lot of fish and can still catch a big one. Uh, the bull wake is one of those baits. It's a smaller profile. It's a really good bluegill imitator. Uh, it fishes in that mid-size, it will catch a lot of fish. I just forgot to bring it with me. The other thing that that bait won't do is it will not imitate terrestrials, rats. Whether that's a rat, whether that's all sorts of other little rat-like critters, squirrels, everything else, whatever rodent might fall into the water, it's not a rat bait. It's a fish imitator. There's always a place for a rat imitator. This is the PB Rat. They make a two-piece, a three-piece, and a four-piece. My favorite is a two-piece. You can do the math. Single joint, lip, soft tail. It's that simple. It really is. Uh, but this is a great imitator of all those terrestrial species. There's a lot of reasons for rats to end up in the water. Sometimes they get in the water and swim, Sometimes they fall out of trees. A big one is if you're on a tidal fishery and you get a really high tide, a king tide, it'll flood all those burrows and everything comes out into the water. You better believe on a king tide, all the big fish know what's coming out of those burrows. And there is a straight up rat pattern going on and you wanna be in on it. That PB rat is not a cheap bait. That is a custom bait. Uh, but it's an amazing bait that I really, really like. One thing I love about this bait is it is a poured resin bait. See all the color and swirl in it? It's poured in the bait. It's not painted. So as you thrash this bait over time and you destroy what should have been a paint job and you cut grooves in it because it becomes your favorite bait, the deeper you carve into this bait and bounce it off docks and rocks and everything else, the color is just in the resin. As you chip away at it, it looks the exact same. That is 
genius. Uh, so even though it is a high dollar bait, uh, it is a very, very good, good bait. Last but not least, northern baits and then rods. And it's perfect timing because the sun's peeking through here. Wow, it is wet out here this morning. I'm just gonna pop this open and show it to you. But I'm gonna wait a second because the longer it's open, the more moisture I'm gonna get on my baits. If you specifically target smallmouth, you can catch them on all these giant baits. I have had two pound smallmouth choke an eight inch Huddleston with no jig hook and get it all the way in and get hooked in the roof and it's wedged in there so tight I could barely even get my fingers in to get it back out. If they want to eat, they will eat. That said, smallmouth in particular love to eat smaller stuff and there are some great in-between baits. I'm just gonna show you my northern box and tell you what my favorites are in this box. Obviously an S-Waver 168, huge player. Uh, I've got a Vitalian in here, several Vitalians. I crush smallies on the Vitalian. I already told you that. The Sneaky Pete also comes in a Pistol Pete. There's a few of them in here. Smaller guy is deadly. The cool thing is that you can fish that on, I mean, light, light gear, like eight pound, 10 pound, 12 pound, on, a, on your jerk bait rod or a topwater rod. Uh, Savage Gear 4 Play, the smaller Ganterelle, the smallest of the Ganterelles, little Shine Glide, um, Magic Swimmer. But really, if I was gonna look in this box and say, what are my top smallmouth baits? It's gonna be a Pistol Pete, an S Waver 168, and a Vitalian. Those would be my key, key baits. Uh, I fish them the exact same ways. It's just a little down, downsized presentation. And, and when I'm saying this, I'm thinking clear water smallmouth, right? There are massive smallmouth on the Tennessee River. You don't change anything. You throw the same baits you throw for everything else and sometimes they eat. But if you're in the North and you've got really clear water, light line can be key. The only way that you can effectively fish light line on a swim bait is that it's a lighter weight bait because otherwise you can't put enough pressure on them to keep them down and get those fish in the boat. You'll end up losing them. So in order to do that effectively and consistently, I go to those smaller baits. I throw the Pistol Pete instead of a Sneaky Pete. I throw the Little Waver instead of a Waver 200. Uh, I throw that Vitalian just because it slaughters them. But I throw it with stock hooks instead of upgrading my hooks so that I can throw it on lighter line. And it works really well. That wraps up the baits. We'll take a minute to talk rods and line, and then we'll be done, guys. But swim bait fishing is amazing. This is something that you need to do. If it's something you want to do, you want to catch a bigger bass, this is something you need to do. If you don't care, you just like catching fish, go throw a worm, it works. It works great. But if big fish interest you, big fish eat other fish. It's a fact of life. This is not the only way to catch a monster bass, but it is a very good way to catch a monster bass. And it's one of the best ways to specifically target them. There are times a year where I crush giants on crankbaits, jerkbaits, A-rigs, but I'm catching big ones and small ones. This is a way to specifically key in on the larger bite. Now, let's talk gear. Uh, Dedicated swim bait gear is really important. I learned some hard lessons early on. We already talked about these lighter rods for the smaller baits. That's a separate animal. True swim bait gear. At a minimum, I personally use a 300 size reel. I use 300s and 400s because they're stronger, they're bulletproof, they're made for it. And I don't wanna buy new reels all the time. If you use 200 size reels, I would say with the exception of the Bantam. The Bantam so far for me has just been bomb proof. That truly is a low profile big bait reel. And there are guys who love a 200 size reel. If you love a 200 and you're stuck to it, I mean that, in my opinion, that's the best reel you could be throwing. Uh, but I like to throw my big baits on dedicated gear on 300 and 400 size reels. In the old days, 
I used all big round reels. And then the Corrado and the Tranks happened and it just replaced everything for me. They're just too good. The Tranks is my main reel. Uh, I use all high speed. So in the Tranks, that's a power handle. I didn't think I liked the power handle. When I got them, the first thing I did was get online and try to find replacements to go back to traditional handles. But before those handles could arrive, I caught my first great big one on it and was like, oh, this is how you just crank in a giant. I've loved a power handle from then on. They feel so good to me. I'm in love with this. Uh, my main big bait setup is a Loomis 966 swim bait rod with a Tranks 300 with 80 pound braid and 35 pound leader. Now, that seems crazy to some people. So I wanna take a minute and explain that. The line. The rod, that's not crazy at all. That's completely understandable. Eight foot rod, you need the right rod, you need leverage. Big ones come up, they wanna jump, you need to be able to knock them down. If you're letting them thrash with a big bait in their mouth, they're gonna throw it. So when they try to jump, you knock them over. When they try to do anything, you knock them over and you drag them to the boat. This isn't a contest. This isn't, let's see who can have the most fun fighting the 12 pounder without losing it. This is get the 12 pounder in the boat, weigh her, take her picture, tell her thank you, get her back in the water, then look at how beautiful she is and let her go, right? If you actually want to land them, the right way to land them is as hard and as fast as you can get them to that boat. Anything short of that is just more time that they have to get off. Now, when it comes to the line, I fish much heavier line than most people. My thinking is twofold. One, if they're looking at the swim bait, they're looking at the swim bait. They're not looking four feet in front of it at the heavy line. They're looking at the swim bait. So I don't really care about the heavy line. The only exception is if I'm fishing really shallow water. If there's any slope at all and my swim bait's coming out, the fish is coming up to meet it. They're never gonna see that line. Only exception, big flats, shallow water, where my braid might be passing the fish for 20 feet before my leader ever gets there, before my swim bait ever gets there. And the fish has just moved off before I even arrive. That's a problem, but that's a very, very rare problem. That's clear water in very rare situations. I love braid to leader. Done properly, you never, ever, ever have failures. I have not broken a swim bait off in cast, I mean cast a swim bait off in 10 plus years. I hear guys talk about breaking braid all the time. They're just doing it wrong. They don't understand braid. 65 to 80 pound. Specifically, I use Power Pro Max Quattro. The reason why is that Max Quattro is a whole size smaller than regular braid. If you buy Power Pro 65 pound and you buy Power Pro Max Quattro 80 pound, they're the same diameter. So use the, the strong one. So when I say I'm using 80, its thickness is 65. I also use really high end leader material. So. I used FC100 for years. It's getting discontinued. So I started looking again and I found the Saltimate. It's also Sunline. Saltimate shock leader. You got mono and fluoro, your preference. Obviously wake baits use mono. The rest of the time, it's up to you. I use a lot of mono. I love stretch, but it's shock leader. So either one is great. Uh, it gives and it comes back, gives and comes back. The beauty of these higher end JDM lines is that they're thinner. So I may be using 30 pound or 35 pound, but it's the same diameter as your 20 or 25 pound cheap line. So a guy will hear me say 80 pound braid to 35 pound leader and they're like, that guy's crazy. And then they go out and throw a 25 pound big game and have no idea that my line is way smaller than their line. So don't get fooled by that number. Just focus on strength of line and thickness of line, the diameter of that line, and you'll be good to go. I don't cast baits off. I have no break offs. Don't ever worry about that. The strength of line, that 80 pound is amazing. I mean, 
I've guided for years and years and years, and I'm talking guys that don't know what they're doing, sending multi hundred dollar baits and then giant backlashes. No break offs. Nobody loses my baits. You just need to set it up properly. I use for my connection knot between the two, there's a connection knot up here somewhere. Right there. I use a blood knot. It's not actually, that one's not a blood knot, but that's because that's not 35 pound. I was striper fishing. That's actually 50 pound on this one. So that I had to tie with something else. I don't tie my blood knot over 40 pound. It just doesn't seat well. But I use a nine loop blood knot for all of my large mouth fishing. Nine loops each way. Let's see if I have another one. There's one right there. That's a blood knot. Nine loops each direction. The reason why I do that, it's not the strongest knot in the world. It is not the smallest knot in the world. What it is, is the knot that when I cinch it, I can look at it and it's either perfect or it's not. And I know right away, that's everything to me. Same reason I don't crimp when I want stinger hooks. I want to know that I know that it's perfect. And if I have to tie a knot and then set on a fish to find out if I tied a complicated knot right, that's no good for me. The blood knot is not the strongest, but it is one that when it's done right, I can look at it and I know it's right and I know it will hold and I'm set. So this is my favorite swim bait combo. Unfortunately, it's been very hard to get lately. So I've got some other rods here for you. Budget rods have come a long way in recent years. Uh, there's a big difference between a big soft bait rod and a big hard bait rod. Typically my soft bait rods, I want them stout so that I can plant that jig hook and just full power, grind them, grind them, get them in the boat. No head shaking allowed, no jumping allowed, no fighting allowed. But when I hook them on hard baits, you're talking treble hooks. At that point, it's like enormous crankbaits. So the rod needs to be a little softer. That Loomis 966 is the only rod I've ever found that does both really well. That's why that's my main rod, because I can just take one rod or several of the same rod and do everything with them and not worry about it. Outside of that, it typically takes two rods if you're throwing both styles. Uh, the 13 Omen Black, this swim bait rod is really good for your big soft baits. The Huddlestons, the big Savage Gears, big Mag Draft, that sort of thing. It's the, I don't wanna misquote myself, the heavy. Eight foot heavy is the one that I really, really like. I mean, it's like a mid 100s rod. It's not outrageous. The rest of these are pretty budget rods. And I have put so much time into testing all of them. They're all really good. So it's Savage Gear Squad, eight foot heavy, killer rod. Uh, another really good reel, that A3. Uh, 13 Fishing Concept A3. I've been very, very happy with that reel. I've done a lot of damage with it and it's held up really well to the brutality. And again, that squad rod, that eight foot heavy, really, really good hard bait rod. Great for glides, great for wakes, great on the budget. Uh, the Dobbins Fury, the 806, I mean, speaks for itself, right? That's one that's been great for years and years and it's solid on the budget. Uh, St. Croix Bass X, they came out with several new ones. Uh, in the St. Croix line, extra heavy equals hard baits. Extra, extra heavy equals soft baits. Okay, I, I actually disagree with that rating. I think they're one power less than what they say. So the extra heavy behaves like some of the other brands heavy. That's why it's great for, for your hard baits and treble hook baits. The extra, extra heavy, that behaves more like the extra heavy from other swim bait brands. So just keep that in mind. That's how you make your decision there. Uh, but that Bass X has been a really solid rod so far. Corrado 300 on that one, another just bulletproof killer, killer reel. Main difference between a Corrado and a Tranks, Tranks has amazing crossover into saltwater. 
Corrado, you would have to take a lot more care of if you're gonna fish it in the salt. Uh, but the Tranks is just such a bomber reel, but obviously you have to pay for them. Uh, and then last but not least is that new Shimano SLX, 7.8 heavy. Uh, I have been crushing fish on this rod. I wanted to put it through the paces. We did a review with it earlier this fall. Uh, when it came out, we were able to get our hands on one and we're just brutal to it. I took it out. The first thing I wanted to do was know how it would really do. So I took it out on giant striper and just took a burrito, six inch burrito and just pounded on big striper just to see how the rod would do it handled so well. Uh, it's another really good all around rod. So I would say super good for your hard baits and then mid size soft baits, but not the giant soft baits. Uh, everything up to like an eight inch, you're good, but not 10 and 12 and beyond. Again, I threw a Tranks on that one because I'm mostly Tranks. So even when I want to test a budget rod, I just take my favorite reel and throw it on there. What it boils down to is the right rod makes a huge difference. Uh, you can get the right rod now at any budget. If you want to spend more, the rods will get lighter and more sensitive. If you want to spend less, they'll be a little more cumbersome but the actions are right. And that didn't used to be a thing. You didn't used to be able to spend a hundred bucks and get a rod that could consistently land a 10 pounder. That's a thing now. So don't feel like you have to break the bank to get a good dedicated swim bait rod. Um, hopefully in the video description, I can fit everything. If I can, at the bottom, I'll list all these rods. They're all great rods. Um, and they're all, there's a bunch of good budget options there for you. Uh, if I can't, I'll leave some of them off. It's going to be pretty crowded down there. But guys, I hope this video helped you. Again, I'm telling you the truth and I'm teaching you how to do it. I'm hoping that you guys will respect these fish. You can do a lot of damage to a fishery in a hurry by taking out the giants. Those are the fish that breed and make more giants. Their genetics are right. So treat them with respect. By all means, catch them. I'm for conservation. Catch them. Enjoy them, put them back. If one dies, it's unfortunate. Occasionally it does happen. I'm sorry if it happens to you. But if you do all the things you can, moving your fish without stinger hooks, if you have to use stingers, put them on the back. If you do the things that you can do and it happens once in a while, it just happens. Don't beat yourself up too hard. It's a whole different ball game if you've done things the wrong way and then kill one, that's a different animal. But they're amazing fish. It's awesome to be able to go out and catch them. I hope you go out and catch a PB. If you do, let us know about it. Send us a picture. We want to share that. We want to know that that's going on and it's working for you. Guys, I hope this video helps you. I hope you enjoyed this. I'm ready to go take a nap. I appreciate you guys. We'll talk to you soon.